Well, good afternoon. Apparently, we are uh, had, had a little glitch, and we're going to start again. So, if I uh, uh, just wanted to welcome each of you to the Women in Art webinar, webinar that's on coping with life's, life's challenges. Uh, for many of you, my name is Lori Bigham, and I am the Chief Nursing Officer and Vice President for Ardent Health Services, and I'm also a member of the Women at Ardent Steering Committee. As many of you know, the Women at Ardent uh, is to aim to elevate women within our company by providing opportunities and resources to increase their visibility, while also continuing to develop leadership skills that further enhance the network of women at Ardent. Before we begin our webinar, I do want to take the opportunity to acknowledge uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was brought and is now laying in state at the Capitol in Washington, D.C. As you know, Justice, Justice Ginsburg is the first woman to receive this honor and uh, before being uh, buried at Arlington National Cemetery in a private ceremony next week. So given women at Ardent, I wanted to just reach out and um, also extend that, um, that honor to uh, Justice Ginsburg. For our Connect purpose today, we need recognize individuals uh, in our organization uh, with exceptional leaders, mentors, and are a good example for our purpose of caring for people. So as you can see, this month, we are highlighting Kim Maddox, who is the Director of Critical Care at BSA Hospital. Kim received many recommendations from the survey that we sent to the Women at Ardent members. Kim has been a source of strength for her team and has demonstrated strong, confident leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. Kim is encouraging and willing to help her team whatever she can and her staff respect her decisions Kim handles stressful situations very well and always seems to have everything under control. Kim's made a positive impact on her entire unit. So Kim, we thank you for your exceptional leadership and your continuing leadership as a woman, a leader within Arden Health Services. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for the webinar today on how to care for yourself and one another during difficult times. Kelly Horn is the Director of Coding Education, Shared Coding Services, HIM, at Ardent Health Services, and Ardent, uh, and the author of Seeing Through the Storm. She became acquainted with adversity after the loss of her father, sister, and two boyfriends. And through this life challenge, Kelly has learned to embrace them as a learning opportunity and has moved forward in a great and positive attitude. Our next speaker is a psychiatrist, Dr. Santos, has worked with adult and adolescent patients for nearly a decade. Uh, she dedicates her skill and expertise in treating patients on the inpatient adult acute behavioral health unit at UT Health Campus North Campus. Dr. Santos received her, her MD from the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. So thank you both Kelly and Dr. Zantos for joining us today and being our speakers. Please, as a reminder, uh, we would ask that you use the WebEx chat function to ask your questions throughout the presentation, and we will be answering them at the conclusion of the presentation. So let us begin um, our, our presentations. Dr. Zantas, I think you are muted. Well, that would certainly help if you could hear me. <laughs> thank you. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay now. Uh, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon, um, you know, especially during these crazy times we've all been extra busy. Um, I'm definitely very excited to be able to contribute to this very important um, and, and timely topic uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic and everything else that's going on in the world. Um, I, I feel like this time we have is, is actually pretty special in the fact that um, we don't have any reports or meeting minutes to write up or progress notes to finish after this 
um, meeting. It's really just for all of us to come together as colleagues and as a second family and, and hear each other's stories. Uh, maybe lighten our load, um, at least temporarily, um, but certainly learn from each other. And if I had one thing I'd like all of you to take away from this talk is better monitor your own health and happiness um, and how to implement as many healthy habits as possible. Um, oftentimes we are kind of the navigators of our ship. Um, we, we all wear so many hats and we're not just employees, but we also serve as mentors and coaches, sisters, brothers, daughters, sons. Um, maybe some of us are parents or even grandparents and certainly most of us are probably breadwinners of the family and, and full-time tutors and teachers now with everything going on. So it's really important to take this time to make sure we're all doing um, what we can to promote our own uh, and the other individuals in our lives, um, health and happiness and, and to kind of increase our happiness meter. And, and I look at it as it's working to build a, a culture of well-being. Um, and as I said before, we would be amiss if we didn't honor um, the notorious RBG and I'm going to read from you uh, for you one of her quotes that I think kind of um, sort of resonates with the topic that we're talking about today. She said, so often in life, things that you regard as imminent turn out to be great good fortune. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly, who certainly has learned um, tremendous lessons from her life, life losses, and she's going to share a little with us now. Thank you so much, Dr. Zantis. This is a great time for us to learn things, and we can definitely learn things from life trials as well. Well, in case you're wondering why a director of coding education is on the call with a psychiatrist providing some good information about life challenges, it's because something happened drastically to me 28 years ago. At that time, my 22-year-old sister died on Thanksgiving morning, and she left behind three little girls who were three, two months, and 10 months. To say that that rocked my world is an understatement. It took me aback. About 30 days before that, though, we had just buried my boyfriend who was paralyzed from the neck down. He had been in the hospital for a year and passed away. And a few years before that, he had had a diving accident which landed him becoming paralyzed, a C5, C6 uh, quadriplegic. I was 20 years old at the time. So I had a lot to learn. I knew I was too young to become bitter, but I didn't know how to get better. The last year or two, we've all been talking about our why statements for service excellence. And some of those things that we've talked about is our why statement. And with our why statement, part of mine or a lot of mine is to learn from everything. And that includes learning from life challenges as well. So on the next slide, I found an incredible statistic. Did you know that grief in the workplace costs companies over $75 billion every single year? And this is from a report that came out in 2003. Only half of that $75 billion is from bereavement. It also includes other things such as family crises, financial loss, major lifestyle alterations. It could probably even include COVID. So because of that, we can't afford not to get this right for our company because of the financial impact it has, but just as equally important, we have to get this right for our team to make sure that we're supported and cared for and that we feel valued as well. And we are going through unprecedented times right now with COVID-19, you are not alone. I know one of the things that our team challenges with, and I guarantee you almost every single person on this call is facing this challenge, is trying to balance work and family and school-aged children and those types of stresses. So, Dr. Zantis, would you be able to share some tips with us as far as having to balance those things and still be able to keep sane? Sure, absolutely. And I think on our next slide, we, we touch on what, what can you expect from children, adolescents, and, and even yourself during these tough times. Um, and so I'm going to go through just a few slides on, on what is normal, um, even though we may not regard it as normal during distressing times. And so the first slide highlights um, what's kind of normal behavior for children, young children, middle aged children and teens right now. Um, when we look at, at behavior, we would like to think that they're going to cope with these stressors um, remarkably and that they're going to be resilient and it's not going to affect them. And in reality, that couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, they're 
they see their parents that are stressed out daily. They hear the news. They're probably more connected to social media and news than we are. And so they certainly affected. And so this chart nicely kind of sums up some behaviors that we might not regard as normal uh, during a non-pandemic or a non-distressful time, but certainly can be seen as normal now. So our younger kids, um, excessive energy, even um, hyperactivity, of course, is normal in younger kids, but even frequent crying, tearfulness, a lot of whininess, um, separation, anxiety, if a caretaker were to leave the house because they're afraid that something's gonna happen if you leave. Um, and then certainly regression can happen. And so a, a kid that may have been toilet trained now, maybe wetting the bed at night, all of these things, are, um, although we may in, in normal times regard them as abnormal, they certainly can be normal during stressful times. And we don't really get too concerned unless they're happening for extended periods of we're talking two weeks or more. And so, you know, it's gonna be tough for kids just as it is for us. They're gonna have tough days. It's really important to learn how to modulate your responses to them and to work with them in a positive manner. And, and the next couple of slides will highlight that. But you can see in, in children that are a little older, so we're looking at eight to 12 year olds, you can see some of the similar sort of maladaptive behaviors. Um, they may sit, complain of being bored or they may kind of shirk their responsibilities and not tend to school as much. Again, if these are a couple of days in a row and they get back on track, anything to be too worried about. But if you see a pattern of weeks or more, then it's something that you you want out and get some help for. And then in our older kids or adolescents, um, 13 to 18, very, they, they have very similar behaviors, um, but they can also complain of um, being just tired, difficulty sleeping, and have outlashes, irritability, and fear. So these are some of the things to look out for. If you see them in isolated events, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something pathologic occurring, but just to understand that this is their way of manifest, manifesting stress during this time. Um, and so what can we do to help our, our younger kids and our adolescents? Um, all of these tips that I have for both the children, adolescents, and on the next slide for adults are the ones I picked up. There's some evidence based um, kind of scientific backing to them. If you could just go back one slide. Um, to, we'll focus on how to help with the kids' stress. Um, most importantly, I think, is to establish routine and expectations. There is so much unknown right now going on between uh, civil unrest and protests, um, the climate change and COVID that kids are really having a hard time grasping on to things that are routine and structure. And kids routine, they crave structure. It's one reason why school is so successful. And so really try to set up a routine. It doesn't have to model the school day exactly, but make it work for you and make it consistent. Um, sleep should be a priority. Younger kids under 12 actually need nine to 12 hours a day. That's I'm sure most kids are not getting that. And our older kids need about eight to 10 hours a day. Exercise and get outside. Again, this has been scientifically proven to lower stress levels, to reduce blood pressure, heart rate, your cortisol stress response. Um, and so one way to do it is to incorporate it with your own exercise um, and, and to make it outside. It, it makes it even more beneficial. Um, it's important for you to check in with your kids and for them to have, whether it's you or another caretaker, grandma, grandpa, uncle, aunt, or a trusted family member, they need to have someone to talk these things out to, someone to bounce things off of, to put things in perspective, because life can seem pretty scary for them right now. And so it's important that you give them that time. And if they're not talkers, I know my throat, it's like pulling teeth to get him to tell me any detail about any of the days at school or anything that's going on in his life at all. Um, you might suggest to them to write it out, to journal or to have a diary where they can write it out as a more helpful coping mechanism than some other things like punching a wall or um, turning to alcohol or drugs. Um, and the last tip for kids that I think is really important. Um, sometimes we feel like kids aren't able to incorporate mindfulness, uh, but they really are. So teaching your kids to be mindful, to think about things before they act on them. Um, and Headspace, which is a great app for adults, the last couple of years has actually um, developed a Headspace for kids that's available to all subscribers um, that have Headspace as the adult subscribers. Um, and in, you might have taken advantage of the year free for healthcare workers um, that, that Headspace was offering, but they offer it for kids under five, kids five to eight, and then 
kids eight to 12, meditation, mindfulness, mindful eating, exercising, sleep routines, it can be a really helpful resource. And so um, I encourage you to use that if you have some kids who are having difficulty um, kind of managing their tempers. And then of course, uh, to the ones that are kind of managing work and home. I know when the uh, pandemic first started off, it felt like, oh, this is a nice break. I don't have to get up every morning and put on work clothes and drive that 30, 40 minutes to work. And this, this seems like it's going to be okay for a little while, but month after month went by and four kids trying to do remote learning and, you know, manage grocery shopping and meal planning and all of that tempers flare, you yell, it just happens. And so I had to kind of take a step back and see what am I doing? This is not working. Children are responding to this, right? And so here are some more evidence-based kind of scientific backed ways that you can cope with your own sort of parenting pandemic stress. I, I think most importantly is to practice self-compassion. If you learn to treat yourself with kindness and you pay attention to your own well-being, you kind of restore your energy and you're able to manage your parenting responsibilities much better. And you're also modeling a good self uh, self care for your, your children. The second one is, you know, easier said than done. Learn how to slow your reaction to stress and communicate in a positive way. And when I read this, I was like, oh yeah, like I said, easier said than done. But when you think about it, you don't go around the world in your workplace yelling at people and snapping at them. And so it really shouldn't be any different at home, no matter how heated the situation gets. Just need to kind of pay attention to your own emotional dysregulation. Remove yourself from the situation. If it's the garage, if it's out in the front yard, uh, when you feel out of control and work yourself back into the situation only once you feel a little more calm. And it, it really only takes a few seconds to breathe, pause and respond in a more healthy way. And, you know, we know from so many studies that harsh verbal communication with children can have very serious um, lasting negative mental health outcomes uh, just as physical uh, abuse does. And so it's really important for us to learn how to slow our reactions when working with our kids. This third one um, is so important, you know, identify your apps and limit those negative social interactions. Strengthen those relationships with people that you know have your back, that you know you think are a good shoulder to cry on, that will make you laugh, that will pick you up when you need it. And keep away from those, you know, kind of negative Nancy, I call them energy zappers, that, that really aren't going to bring anything positive to your life. Um, you know, try to trim down those negative influences. Um, and similarly, the, the number four point is to remove as much negative news as you can. Um, this is, you know, don't keep your TV on in the background all day on CNN. Um, there's so much negative news going on right now that there's no way that it can't seep into our unconsciousness um, and affect our behavior and our mood. And, and along with that comes social media, you know, put out the negative social media. You'll be doing yourself the biggest favor during these times. Again, just with kids, exercise and spending time in nature, both of them are shown to reduce stress if you combine the two, and it's even more stress reduction. If you bring your kids into the activity, it's a perfect way to really get everybody outside, get that blood pumping and, and improve everyone's mood. And then if, if you're constantly feeling stressed out, if you're feeling out of control, you're unable to stop yelling at your kids, you're unable to modulate your own behavior, and you know that you're setting bad examples for your kids, you know, that's really when it's time to reach out and seek some support. And we'll talk a little bit about some more signs a little later um, that you may need to seek some professional mental health. Those are some great tips, Dr. Santos, especially when you hit home about, you know, conversations and actions that go on in the in the home. It's so easy for us to let our hair down a little bit more on some of those instances. So I appreciate you addressing that. We can all improve, improve those verbal um, interactions that we have with our family. It's also important that we can identify those that are experiencing impactful life challenges. Sometimes it is obvious. We wear it on our sleeve. Um, we may even let people know that we're struggling and we may even ask for help, but there's a big group of people that may not ask for help because it may be perceived that we're weak. And so um, I look forward to you sharing those signs with us a little bit later on, on is it just that we need some extra encouragement and hope and support, or is it something that we really do need to seek out additional support? So thank you for sharing that. We also may see um, some of our coworkers expressing that anger or depression, that has to do with the five stages of grief with Dr. Kubler-Ross, and we'll talk about that um, in a different way in, on the next a couple of slides coming up. 
the number one thing I want you to hear from this message today, in my opinion, is that you are normal. What you're facing is normal. I know in 1992, when my sister and boyfriend died, I was experiencing all kinds of emotions at a level I had no idea was possible. And I wondered if something was wrong with me, but I learned that there wasn't. You are normal no matter what you face, you're not alone. We do have to talk about some of these misconceptions though. One of them is ignoring it. We don't want to ignore it because in my opinion, ignored grief leads to unresolved grief and that impacts your marriage, your parenting, your job performance, everything in life. And life is too short for us to go through it without really dealing with things that are happening to us so we can get some positive benefits from it as well. We don't always have to be strong. Sometimes the bravest people that I know are the ones that actually say, hey, I need help, I need hope, I need support. There's not a time frame. Different people experience different issues, different experiences differently and at different levels. The most important thing is that we're always working on it. And then lastly, um, just to acknowledge those who have had loved ones um, die, lots of loved ones, especially with the holidays coming up, that's always a very difficult time of year. I want to reassure you that moving on or being happy, it doesn't mean that you're forgetting. Life is short and there are still people around you at work, at home, friends, family that are still alive. And we don't wanna cheat ourselves or them on making good memories with them as well. So we can actually balance the two at the same time. We can remember our loved ones while moving forward and making the best of life with those who are still around on earth. And in my opinion, the most normal and natural thing that you can do during these times is to get connected and stay connected to people who support you and who have your back and who are speaking that life into you and finding those resources that work for you that are encouraging you to move forward. I mentioned Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief. That was mentioned to me back in the day. I looked at it, read a little bit about it, but to me it was common sense. I knew I would feel anger. I knew I would feel depression. I needed something a little bit more. I needed help with how am I going to turn this into a positive? So what I did is I just worked on it every day and I coined the phrase five stages of growing through grief. People ask me, how did I become better and not bitter? And I thought about it, prayed about it. These are the five things that I did to help me become better, not bitter. Number one, grieve the way you want. So whatever I was facing, right or wrong, I just acknowledged it, dealt with it, and worked on it every single day, starting right where I am. Number two, ask why. I had to ask why to get to the how. How am I going to get through the day? Sometimes how am I going to make it through the hour, let alone how am I going to learn from this and make my life better from having gone through it? The third one is very important, keep living. This is super hard because the pain is real, it's deep. How, how can everyone around me keep going on? How can they keep living their life? But yet at the same time, I needed to find a way to be a part of that with the weddings that were coming up, with babies being born, with whatever happens in life, not to just stay isolated, but find a way to take part in those celebrations as well. Again, life is short, we have to keep living. Number four, reach out to others. This is really important. Even if you're hurting, it's important to reach out to others. When my sister died on Thanksgiving Day, we didn't have cell phones and texting and all that back then. Within 15 to 20 minutes, when we got home from the hospital, there was a knock at the door. And I was surprised when we answered it and it was my boyfriend who had passed away just you know, a few weeks earlier. It was his parents there to express sympathy to us and bring us meals for comfort amazing they had just lost their son their only son and here they are reaching out to us and i still remember that years later and number five sing it loud and proud i like to compare this to somebody who encounters the healthcare system with a traumatic injury first they go to the emergency room they may even be in icu for a while then they go to med surge up on the floor and then eventually they find themselves in rehab we have to wait until we get to the rehab part of our life where we can reflect back on our life challenges and go, okay, now that I've been stabilized, I've gone through ER, ICU, med surgery, what have you, now I'm in rehab, how am I going to figure out how to move forward in spite of what has happened? And that's how we wanna look at our life challenges as well. And once you learn those lessons, 
you integrate that into the rest of your life to make it even better. And I'll tell you how I did that here in a few slides. Which leads me to our next slide, which says life challenges are hidden treasures. I'm gonna say that again, because I know that's foreign. Life challenges are hidden treasures. They are things that we can learn from. There's things that we get from treasures or from trials that we can get no other way. I wanna read you an excerpt that I have in my book. If life challenges are a treasure, why do very few people desire it? Why isn't everyone searching for it? When I think of treasure, I think of diamonds, mansions, lots of money, etc. I would not naturally say that life challenges such as grief are a treasure, especially since so much pain is involved and it takes so long to complete the learning process. In fact, the only thing that keeps me from becoming bitter is that I understand the value of it. I hate the pain, but I have to accept that in order to experience the future blessings. It's all about how I view the situation. At the end of the day, it makes me a better person and that is what life is all about. So I wanna give you an example because I don't find a lot of literature that talks about life challenges being gold or silver or diamonds or hidden treasures. So the treasure that i learned from my boyfriend who died, the one that was, re um, that was paralyzed from the neck down, I learned to embrace my faith like no other. I wrestled with my faith because I believed that God was going to heal him, he was going to make it, and the answer was no. But I learned that it's okay, I can even wrestle with my faith. With my sister, I learned to prioritize my role as an aunt above all other relationships in this world, and I have not regretted that to this day. So as you can see back in 1992, as a 20-year-old or a 21-year-old, I was able to be the navigator of my ship, as Dr. Zanta said, and I got to look at my situation and say, you know what, I'm going to reorganize my life. My highest priority is gonna be my faith, and my second highest priority will be my family, especially my role as aunt. So then fast forward 17 years later, which was 11 years ago, I had a second boyfriend who passed away unexpectedly as well. The treasure I learned from that was really important. Even though I am grieving, the clock is still ticking, and that's why I keep living purposefully. So yes, I had to go through the same exact growing process again, but now I have a sense of urgency about life. I know what's important to me, and I better figure out what I want to do in life and, and focus on what matters most because we don't get a do-over. This is not a dress rehearsal. Whether you're grieving, no matter how hard life is, we have to live life to the fullest. So on the next slide, it's all about attitude. I love the poem Chuck Swindoll says. Here's an excerpt from it. Life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. That's not a typo. Life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And you can see there on the slide where it says, we cannot control what happens to us, but we can do all these things right here. I will tell you my boyfriend, the one that was paralyzed from the neck down, um, you know, just being a normal, natural 20 year old, we would just complain about just stupid little things. And when I did, he would take his paralyzed arm and he would play that air violin for me as if to say, you think you have it bad, when? you know? And he also made me a poster that said, focus on what you can do, not on what you can't do. I still have that poster to this day. This made a huge impact on my life. Here's a guy who was paralyzed from the neck down telling me to focus on what we can do. It was amazing. So I'd like to ask you to consider something today. I'd like to ask you to consider a different approach to stress, suffering, and grief. What would happen? How could our lives be transformed if we opened our minds to learning from our life challenges? So let's look at our purpose. Our purpose is caring for people, our patients, their families, and one another. So let's see how we can connect the dots from our purpose statement here to what we do during our life challenges. On our next slide on caring for ourselves, we have to learn to care for ourselves in order to care for others effectively. I love the quote that says, self-care is giving the world the best of you and not what's left of you. So cool. So there's a few things that you can do. I'll just tell you what worked for me back in the day. I found a song to listen to every day, and I found a quote to listen to every day. 
the song was holding out hope to you. And the quote was, as for me, I will always have hope. So on the next slide, caring for one another, I would like to bring up this little concept of little care gifts. There's things we can do every single day in the course of our daily life at work or home. We can send a little text, thank you, thinking of you. Um, I haven't forgotten you. Thank you, you had my back. I appreciate the way you did such and such. It doesn't cost any time or money, just a little bit of effort. Just real quick, in the interest of time, I wanna share, we had a high nurse on our team, a health information integrity nurse. She lost her son a couple of years ago. And I reached out to her and asked her what helped. And you know what she said? She said, when my team checked on me regularly, every few weeks, either by phone, email, or a text. And then she even said, coming to work weeks afterwards and getting an I am thinking of you email could be just what she needed to get through the day. I will tell you, she worked as if nothing happened and people probably didn't know she was struggling that day, but just those little things made the difference. So I'd like to ask you to take a moment um, in the chat queue, what ideas do you have for little ways that we can express care for our team members? Maybe it's a little something that was done for you or something you did for something else. So if you'd like to participate, I'd like you to go ahead and answer that in the chat queue at this time. Um, we do have a special shout out to our healthcare providers. Uh, because of COVID, whether it's nurses, dietitians, housekeepers, respiratory therapists, any kind of therapist, we know you're hurting. We know you're facing challenges unlike anything that we've gone through before. I just want to let uh, bring some awareness to the topic. We know you're hurting. We know you need support. We know healthcare workers are strong and don't always ask for support. So I would like to encourage people on the call to not only give them a thank you, but to back that up with some sort of an action. And another shout out to a director of nursing at an Albuquerque facility. I came across an email that she shared with her group. Absolutely amazing. She included all throughout the email, thank you so much, I appreciate you. She even said, I'm learning from you and with you. My door is open day and night, and I love this one right here. I have your back, and so does our company. So finishing up on the next couple of slides before I turn it back over to Dr. Xantis, our, let's look at our behavior standards. We see our purpose statement often, and we see our behavior standards, and sometimes, quite frankly, we're not sure how to translate that and to connect the dots. Well, how we respond to our life challenges affects every single pillar that we have. If we stay connected to our team members who are hurting, we're applying people. Service excellence, let's at the same time where we're focusing on our external customers, let's remember to focus on our internal customers, which are each other, and that applies to service quality. Quality, our response affects how well we perform our job daily during this time. Growth, of course, we don't wanna just survive, we wanna make our lives better for having been through what we've experienced. And then finally, financial, we've already talked about that it has a big financial impact on this if we can learn to um, apply these principles to our life challenges. And finally, before I turn it back over, I would like to know what will be your next step as a result of hearing some of these things that Dr. Xantis and I talked about. I have them labeled by letter, so if you would like to type in the chat queue which one you plan to apply, we would love to hear from you. A, will it be you'll choose one resource to learn more about, which we're gonna talk about here in the next few slides, such as MyStrength, One Team Resource Center, et cetera. B, maybe you're going to check into the Employee Assistance Program. Those are some free counseling sessions. C, create a daily affirmation to repeat to yourself. Ask for me, I'll always have hope. I've got this, we can do this. D, create a daily routine that energizes and encourages you. E, perhaps you'll reach out to a colleague who is experienced in a life challenge. F, send a thank you note or text to a colleague who has cared for you during a difficult time. G, set up one-to-ones with my team to stay connected. Or H, connect with someone experiencing similar challenges. So I'd like to turn it back over to you, Dr. Xantis, and I know you're going to talk to us about some warning signs on knowing when we just need extra support and encouragement versus should we take that extra step and get some professional support? Yes, absolutely, Kelly. Thank you so much for um, really your, your um, almost tear-provoking uh, accounts of some, of some of your personal history, and thank you for sharing us, that with all of us. Um, 
you know, I'm going to discuss some resources that um, Arden sort of company wide offers to all of its employees, which are really exciting resources. But before we get to that, you know, I just want you to be aware of, of some of the signs that you may need to seek help sooner rather than later. Um, and there's some that are kind of absolute need for professional assistance versus some maybe softer signs. Um, and I also want to highlight that in psychiatry, we usually wait until there's kind of significant functional impairment before we uh, diagnose something or, or call it a disorder. But, you know, everyone on this call is, is a high functioning and we're often perfectionist, you know, professionals and functional impairment for us may not occur until the problem is very advanced. And so instead, I usually use quality of life as my main indicator when discussing treatment plans with my patients. If your quality of life is significantly impacted for more than a few weeks and you're struggling to find happiness, anything to look forward to in that day, um, then that's really, you know, when you should seek some help. And so in terms of psychiatric symptoms that we that we usually suggest people would seek help would confuse thinking. So if you're just having a really tough time with concentration or actually confused about, did I do things or um, did this actually happen? That would be a sign. Prolonged depression, either sadness or irritability for two weeks or more. Um, extreme highs and lows. So if one day you're on top of the world and you're really, really happy and making tons of plans, the next day you're in your bed crying and isolating from the world, that would be a sign. Excessive fears or anxiety, social withdrawal, and changes in eating or sleeping habits. Really strong feelings of anger, especially if there's some intent behind the anger. Um, and then if you have some strange thoughts that aren't based in reality, like delusions, um, paranoid thoughts, or seeing or hearing things that aren't there. Uh, of course, suicidal thoughts um, being kind of the hallmark that everyone knows about, but all of these, these symptoms are important to look at. Um, and then I think it's so common, particularly in our healthcare professionals and our doctors and nurses, to monitor their substance use. I think a certain amount um, is kind of considered normal amongst uh, doctors or nurses, but if you are starting to use substance and didn't before, or if you're used and you have to be honest with yourself, is accelerating or more than it was before the pandemic, it really may be time to seek some help. And, and we'll go over some resources that Arden offers, like I said, company-wide to all of its employees. Um, so the first one that we're gonna talk about is a very important resource. It's the Employee Assistance Program um, through Ardent. And so it is, offers both you as the employee as well as family members. And you don't even have to be enrolled in any of the benefits that, that Ardent offers and a benefit plan to enjoy these um, this assistance program. And so it offers uh, assistance with a whole host of of issues, stress and anxiety, depression, like we were talking about before, alcohol or drug use, even things like parenting or family concerns, grief or bereavement, anger management, conflicts at work, any of these issues, you can receive up to five face-to-face -face visits with a mental health provider. And so that's very valuable. Um, and it's for any issue. Each issue, you can have five face-to-face uh, -face visits. And so if you are going through a divorce one year and you need to utilize the employee assistance program, please use it. And next year, maybe if your teenage daughter or son is struggling um, with an eating disorder or substance use issues, you again qualify for those five face-to-face -face visits. So this is a very uh, valuable program and, and all of us should utilize it if we need to. Outside of COVID, it's just any, in, any type of mental health issue. Um, the second one we're going to highlight is the My Strength app. It's available, of course, on, on an online account, but most people would use it on, on an app. Um, and this is free to all Arden employees, family members 13 years of up and older. It's available 24-7 through the app. Um, and it utilizes all kinds of um, hundreds of quick activities that you can use. It's personalized, so you go in there and answer a few questions, and it personalizes it to your life situation. And you can get guidance from a dedicated coach or just kind of use all of the inspirational tools that they have there. And this uh, is sort of evidence based um, and that it uses a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy techniques to help really change the way you think about things and really make some um, lifelong changes in your behavior. I'll touch really quickly on the One Team Resource Center. I know um, we don't have it quite yet at the UT Health North Campus, but it's, it's coming quickly. But in the past, if you needed to read things, you'd have to do this extensive like Google search. Here, this is a sort of a one-stop shop for every learning need that you might have within the work uh, 
field. And so maybe how to have a difficult conversation with a coworker, how to handle uh, work life stress. You could find it all here. And so there's lots of in, important resources that you can find on the, in this one sort of one stop shop. Um, and so I did want to mention the one resource center and then I've listed here on the next some national resources. I do want to highlight they're all great resources. Um, there is uh, the Acad Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. There are some resources for helping parents and kids cope with COVID and some national hotlines. There's a suicide prevention lifeline, which is an important number to have. But there's also um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration helpline. And this is more for resources on a national basis. And it's available in English and Spanish and it's 24 7. NAMI is a great. Um, resource. It's in virtually every community. It stands for National Alliance of Mental Illness, and it provides support for both the families and um, the patients who are suffering from the mental illness. And so I encourage you to take a look at their website and see what resources are in your area if you are in need at all. And to take the stigma-free test that's available on the NAMI website, I think all of us should do that. We don't really know if we have stigma against something unless we research it and we and we know if it exists. And so this little quiz will help you determine whether you have stigma against others with mental health, but even more importantly, if you have stigma against identifying mental health within mental illness within yourself. And I always tell the patients, you know, it's the easy thing to do to do nothing at all. It really takes a lot of bravery and a lot of courage, like Kelly had mentioned before, to admit that you need help. And so if you or a family member need help, take that step today and, and be brave and be courageous and get it for yourself or your family member. And I think that's all the resources we have. So uh, turn it over to Jessica. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly and Dr. Zantas for all of that great information. Um, it just, so many resources have been shared. So we did get a couple questions that I would love to, to toss back to you guys. And the first one that I think would be really relevant is what would you guys recommend not saying to someone who is grieving the loss of a loved one? Maybe they want to reach out, but they're just not 100% sure what to say. So what would you first not say? I, I think I've learned through uh, lessons with my patients of, I think what the one thing not to say is I I know what you're going through because you don't know what they're going through, right? You may have gone something through something similar. Um, but I think that that can be off-putting to people to say, I know what you're going through because they could think, no, you have no idea what I'm going through. And I usually start start in a conversation like that. I have no idea what you're going through. I, I know that you must be going through pain. I don't know exactly what you're going through, but I'm here for you and I'm here to listen and I'm here to help in any way I can, you know. Jessica, I was, this is one that most people don't think about, but I know when my boyfriend died, when they said, well, you can find another boyfriend, or when my sister died, at least she's not suffering, or she's in heaven, and I wrote about that, and I'll get you those tips so we can get that out on um, our resources, but the way I respond to that is, I, I, I don't care about all that. I'm just worried about myself. How am I going to get through the day? So I have found personally, and from what I hear from others, the best thing to say is, I'm sorry, or I'm thinking of you, and leave it at that. Very powerful. So good, so good. Well, guys, we have a few more questions, but unfortunately, we're kind of um, down to the last few minutes here. So I did want to go ahead and um, let everyone know and kind of remind everyone that all of the resources that we talked about today are going to be shared with everyone who registered, and they're also going to be available on the Women at Ardent website. So you don't have to worry about writing anything down because we've compiled a great list for you all um, to be able to reference after the fact, as well as this recording of this webinar, it will be posted on the Women at Ardent website too. So you can go back and listen to all the great advice and insights that Kelly and Dr. Zantis have given to us. Um, I also wanted to let you know that our October uh, Women at Ardent webinar will be uh, related to the topic of making yourself heard at work. Um, so it's going to be a really great conversation, another great session. So be on the lookout for communications for that. Again, all the details will always be on the Woman at Ardent website, but you'll also probably be receiving communications and you can opt in on this next slide to text messages. Um, 
by texting the word women to 95159. You can also send any questions that you have to women at ardenthealth.com. And again, if you go to that ardenthealth.com slash women's site, you can subscribe to the emails and then you'll just always be notified of upcoming sessions. So thank you guys so much. Thank you to Kelly and Dr. Zantis and to the whole team uh, for putting this on today. Really appreciate your time and appreciate all of you participants for attending and asking the great questions. So thank you and we'll talk to you guys soon. Yes, thank you everybody. Thank you.